There are many people who look at Buddhism and, and often wonder what does Buddhism have to do with social engagement and what does Buddhism have to do with social service. Uh, for some people, the impression that they have of Buddhism is a kind of detachment from, from the world and its problems, from the world of samsara, or the world of suffering, as the Buddha and others have referred to it. But actually, you know, the, the very first symbol of the Buddha was uh, two footprints. Long before there were statues of the Buddha, there were, the Buddha was symbolized by two footprints, which symbolized his presence, but I also like to think about them as symbolizing the fact that the Buddha walked a lot. The Buddha walked from village to village. He reached out to people. He was always communicating with people. The collection of Buddha's teachings is nothing but the assemblage of the conversations that the Buddha had with many people that he would encounter throughout his travels. What does Buddhism have to offer today? There, I want to quote my teacher, Daisaku Ikeda, who is a, a great Buddhist teacher in Japan, and he said, we live in a time when all and sundry are in strife. That the one force that is strong enough to penetrate that is a profound awareness of one's own Buddha nature, or divine quality, if you will, as well as the Buddha nature inherent in other people. So this is the force. So when we awaken to our, the sanctity of our own life and the sanctity of the lives of others, and we treat them that way, that this is a force that is powerful enough to break through the basically conflictual nature of our era. There's a story in Buddhism, I love to tell this story, it's the, the story of bodhisattva never disparaging. Bodhisattva means one who is pr on pursuing the Buddhist path. And Bodhisattva never disparaging was not good at study. He wasn't that good at meditation. What he would do instead, every person he would greet, he would bow to them and he would say, I deeply respect you. I could never disparage you. You are sure to be a Buddha. And people would assault him saying, who are you to predict me being a Buddha? You seem pretty insignificant. But he persisted this way. Every person he met, he bowed in reverence to their Buddha nature. And the story, the story goes on to say, this is in one of the chapters of the Lotus Sutra, and the story ends up, we see at the moment of, the, of this Bodhisattva's death, imminent death, of old age, I think, he has this great awakening, this great transformation. He suddenly, after this lifetime of revering others, has this wonderful awakening where he perceives all the Buddha's teachings and he prolongs his life and he teaches with great eloquence and he leads so many people to enlightenment. And we find later that, that the Buddha says, you know who that person was, that Bodhisattva was, and his disciples say, who? He said, that was me in a past life. That's how I got to be Buddha, is by revering the Buddha nature in other people. And so we see the notion of respect for others, reverence for others as being not only a nice ideal, but a personally transformative experience. And not one that is done by withdrawing from society, but by engaging society. So this model of engagement, of reverence for others, is an important model that comes to us from the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra, in turn, is the Buddhist teaching that the Nichiren tradition of Buddhism, the Nichiren school or tradition of Buddhism, there are many schools, and, and in, in turn the SGI, which is a lay Buddhist association based on that, comes from this. So this notion of respect for all life, of the practice of reverence for others, is a core practice and I think it's a core practice that's very sorely needed today.